Hello, everyone. Today, Xiang Qian and I will give an introduction and deep dive for the Kubernetes Data Protection Working Group. My name is Xin Yang. I work at a VMware in the cloud storage team. I'm a co-chair of CNCF Tech Storage, a co-chair of Kubernetes Six Storage. I also co-lead the Data Protection Working Group with Xiang Qian. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Shang Qian. I work in uh, for Google. I'm right now uh, co-leading the data, data protection working group with Xin. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, today, Xin, Xin and I will go through um, these topics and based on the agenda. Uh, we will I will go through what the, what motivated us to establish this working group, and uh, who are the parties that get involved in this data production working group and uh, explain a little bit what we think uh, data protection is in the Kubernetes context and go through what are the existing building blocks or modules that allows application owners or cluster owners to protect the uh, stateful workloads and what exactly are the gaps that this working group is looking to build or propose to help providing data protection in the Kubernetes context. And the very last, Shin will go through how to get involved in this data working group, that uh, this working group. Next, please. Um, as you, many of you may be very well aware of, um, the day one operations for stateful workloads are actually pretty well supported in Kubernetes context. In order to, uh, they are persistent volume operations, uh, including provision in a volume, attach a volume to a specific node to uh, hold your data, your or your workloads and data uh, to the app orchestration APIs, like workload APIs deployments and state forces supports to use those persistent volumes in an application context. It's been there for a couple of years and is very stable. Uh, with that, the direct impact is more and more stateful workloads like databases, message queues, et cetera, et cetera, are looking forward to utilize those constructs uh, as well as Kubernetes, uh, very nice feature of scaling, scalability, et cetera, et cetera, to move into the Kubernetes environment. However, uh, the day to maintenance operations for, for example, to how do I protect my stateful workload within the Kubernetes context is still uh, in need. Uh, it's very limited at this moment uh, for various of reasons. Uh, Kubernetes users as of today uses GitOps to protect their stateful workloads config files, but the story around how do I protect my uh, stateful workload, including the configs as well as the volume data is still yet to be, uh, is still yet to be discovered and uh, also supported by the community. Next slide, please. With all this reality, uh, the, uh, there's a lot of companies that are supporting this initiative uh, for providing data protection in Kubernetes context. The listed companies over here uh, actively attending data protection working group meetings in a uh, bi-weekly basis. Uh, if I missed any company over here, please kind of let me know uh, or we, will, we can add your names there. Next slide, please. Uh, moving next, so one of the charter is to, for this data protection working group is to define what exactly it means to protect protection, uh, stateful workload in Kubernetes. The main purpose of this group is to propose and uh, design modules to ensure uh, an application like database, including its config and data to be restored to a previously preserved state, meaning a backup. Uh, if the in case there's any disaster happen to that application, that could be lost in of a cluster or clumsy hands just delete the whole namespace where the application is wrong, etc. In 
Kubernetes context mainly basically involves two pieces. The one piece is the API resources that uh, describes the application. And the other piece, which is more critical, is the persistent volume data the application writes into the disk. Uh, this is a very complicated and uh, a layered problem. Uh, it, it includes backup and recovery at different levels, uh, including persistent volume uh, at the application level or even up to the cluster level. When the cluster is actually gone, you want to restore the whole thing into a new cluster. Next slide, please. So as part of the, as I mentioned previously, part of the working group's charter is to define a list of Kubernetes native constructs to enable uh, those workflows, data operations to protect your stateful workload. Uh, that includes at how do you provide uh, constructs to protect the persistent volumes. Uh, we have volume snapshot and volume backup and volume restore, of course, to when, uh, when restoration is needed. And the application level is more about what composes an application, right? What are the resources? Is that stateful set, the secrets, and the service that application exposed, et cetera? And uh, another tricky piece is a lot of application wants to achieve uh, application consistency snapshot or backup. That means uh, it, needs, it needs to be able to quiet, uh, basically freeze itself from writing before the backup is taken and unfreeze itself after the backup is taken. That's the quiet and quiet hooks I was talking uh, that in the slides talking about. And then lastly, uh, what is the orchestration look like at the namespace level and the cluster level? Next slide, please. So talking about all the definitions, let, now let's drill down a little bit. Um, what are the common use cases? All right, there are three listed over there, but there, there are definitely more, but those three are very typical uh, and it covers a different layer. So more typical thing is that you as a MySQL database owner, right? You want to protect your MySQL database to cover, cover like common failure scenarios. For example, a bad, bad rollout, right? Uh, you have a bug in your, in your system and they uh, corrupted your data you want to roll back into the previous state. And the other scenario is more about migrating or geo expansion, meaning that, okay, you have a database running in uh, Europe. Now you want to expand your business into Asia. In this case, you want to migrate whatever the data from one area to another area. The, those are the common use cases for us as an um, SQL database owner or application owner. Uh, if move up a little bit to the class owners, uh, uh, role, uh, not typically uh, namespace owner, typically that is owned by a cluster administrator. They want to enforce protection uh, over the namespaces they own in the cluster. Uh, that not necessarily means that they understand every single workload within the namespace, but they have the desire to protect the cluster as a whole. Uh, should disaster uh, happens, the cluster owner can seamlessly restore uh, a cluster as a, as a unit, as a single unit, or namespace as a single unit from an existing backup. Moving further up, uh, in big organizations, especially for enterprise businesses, they uh, typically have this data protection administrator uh, who wants to enforce an organizational like RTO or RPO policies over every single workload running on Kubernetes clusters. Uh, they typically do not understand the details of the workload runs running on those Kubernetes clusters. And the only thing they want to enforce is uh, you have this application running on a production Kubernetes cluster, uh, I want it to follow a certain policy that it's backed up in a certain schedule and it can be restored at, to at any given point of time such that to satisfy the company's compliant requirement, et cetera, et cetera. And with all these common use cases, and even uh, there's, there's a lot more, of course, uh, that 
drives the working group to you know uh, deliver uh, desired components to to achieve those goals. Next slide, please. So with this, let's. Uh, I want to walk walk you through what exactly a backup workflow look like. Uh, so uh, within the Kubernetes context, so the on that workflow starts from the left and it ends up in the right. So basically, a user kicks off a backup process, and this process, as mentioned previously, includes two pieces. One is the Kubernetes resource uh, that that backup can contain may be scoped to a certain application, for example. Uh, this resource will is most likely, uh, in many cases, just a simple API resource YAML file dump and uh, getting exposed into some remote repository that has an independent life cycle to your cluster. And the other major piece is this so-called data backup. Right. Uh, there are many ways you can do data backups. Right. Uh, one uh, one of these is using the application native data dump. Uh, typical tools like a MySQL dump or Kafka dump, etc. This kind of thing. You basically dump whatever the data into a, a, a backup location, and then there's some remote. Uh, there's some local process that copies this dump data to a remote uh, location. Again, this remote location has to be like kind of, you know, uh, have independent life cycle to your cluster so that you can restore from it. Another way is the so-called controller coordinated. So uh, it, it is a module that the community is looking forward to uh, provide in the future as well. Uh, basically, it's ag agnostic to uh, what kind of application it is. What it does is that it, it gives uh, it first go ahead and check, uh, okay, should I acquire this application so that no more writes is accepted? And then it conducts volume snapshot using the volume snapshot API, et cetera, and doing the volume backup and then unquires the, uh, unquires the uh, application. After all this is done, then the volume data get uh, transported again to an external uh, location so that it can you know, have an independent life cycle. This is basically describes the whole uh, like really 1,000 foot view of the backup workflow. Uh, moving to restoration. Next slide, please. It's kind of the reverse, right? So basically, the user starts a restoration, and then the first thing is to import whatever the backup from a remotely uh, maintained storage system, uh, typically object storage, uh, into your Kubernetes cluster, and uh, that has two pieces as well. One piece is the Kubernetes restore, uh, resources, basically uh, recreates the deployment or state process that uh, recreates the secrets, recreates the uh, service service configs for your application. And then when you ask for the storage layer, it, it recreates the PVC and then falls back into two branches as well. Uh, once the one branch is, once the volume is there, the uh, the application specific or application native native tools can read from the remote and restore data from a data dump into the into the volume and the application can or orchestrate all the restoration process, or rather a more Kubernetes way uh, like rehydrate a uh, PVC from a previously stored volume snapshot or volume backup. Next slide, please. Uh, given that, right, after describing the workflows, so uh, what are the modules needed to accomplish all these workflows, right? There are a couple of existing building blocks in this uh, in the uh, Kubernetes community to already support that. Uh, in the application layer, you we have stateful sets and deployment daemon sets, which are really uh, well established workload APIs. And those workload APIs can easily uh, tell you what are the resources contained for an uh, contained for this application by doing a simple label query. Uh, there's also an application CRD which tells you what are the components compose this uh, a particular application. Uh, in the storage layer, there's a volume snapshot which is a GA feature. Uh, it's a CSI snapshot that built on top of PB, uh, built on top of the CSI driver. Uh, next slide, please. But 
let's uh, if you look at this picture, so the workload APIs like set for set and the SIG apps application CRDs fits uh, solves kind of you know uh, solves part of the problem of uh, figuring out what are the Kubernetes resources that uh, backup pro process should be backing up. And next slide, please. And the, the William snapshot feature is really uh, fit into the data piece where uh, there's no, let's say there's no uh, native native application, native data dump. Uh, the controller can go ahead and create the William snapshots from a PVC and then acquires the application. With that, next slide, please. There's a lot more. Uh, with that in the restoration process, the volume snapshot can be used natively to rehydrate the PVC from uh, from it. Go ahead, uh, next slide, please. With this, I there's still a whole bunch of missing building blocks, right? Uh, volume backup or change block tracking, which allows very efficient volume backup, and the data populator, which reads the uh, volume backup and repopulate the PVC. Uh, we're talking about a remote place to store your backup so that it has uh, such that it has an independent life cycle than the cluster itself and acquires and acquires hooks that allows application level sorry application consistent snapshots etc uh, all this are, are yet to be built fitting into the workflows next slide please uh, this gives you an overview of what are missing components uh, in this community, right? The green box are existing ones, the yellow box are ongoing efforts, and the orange boxes are to be to be uh, to be designed. Uh, Shin will give more details into this one. Uh, next slide talks about the restoration, similar things. Uh, yellow boxes are the causes uh, basically an effort to provide uh, object storage interface and uh, the green box uh, sorry the green box are existing ones and uh, the orange box are yet to be developed or proposed with that I'm going to hand over to Shin to continue uh, a deep dive into the missing blocks thanks Shin thanks Chen Chen So the first missing building block we identified is volume backup. We need this because we need to extract data to a secondary storage. We've already got a volume snapshot API, but there's no explicit definition made in the design to have snapshots stored on a different backup device separate from the primary storage. Uh, for some cloud providers, snapshot is actually a backup that is uploaded to an object store in the cloud. However, for most other storage providers, uh, a snapshot is locally stored alongside the volume on the primary storage. Without a volume backup API, the alternative is for backup vendors to have two solutions. For storage systems that upload snapshots to object store automatically, a snapshot is a backup for storage systems that only take local snapshots, use the volume snapshot API to take the snapshot and then have a data mover to upload the snapshot to a backup device. We are at a very early stage of discussions about this one. So uh, let's take a look at this diagram. Volume backup is next to volume snapshot here we put it in an orange box to indicate that it is a missing Kubernetes component. We have started discussions about it, but there's no concrete design yet. The next one is the CBT, change block tracking and the change file list. Without CBT and change file list, backup vendors have to do full backups all the time. This is a not space efficient takes longer to complete and needs more bandwidth. Another use case is snapshot-based replication where you take snapshots periodically and replicate to another site for disaster recovery purpose. So what are the alternatives? Without CBT, we can either do full backups or call each storage vendor's API individually to retrieve CBT, 
which is highly inefficient. We are currently doing a design for this feature. Let's take a look of this diagram. So CBT is next to volume backup and volume snapshot as it's used to make backups more efficiently. It is in a yellow box indicating it is work in progress. The third missing building block is backup repository. Backup repository is a location or repo to store data. This can be an object store in the cloud, on-prem storage location, or NFS-based solution. There are two types of data to be backed up that we need at the restore time, Kubernetes cluster metadata and local snapshot data. We need to back them up and store them in a backup repository. Currently, there is a proposal for object store backup repository. That's the um, proposal for object bucket provisioning or COSI. This, propo this proposes object storage Kubernetes APIs to support orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. Therefore, bring in object storage as the first class citizen in Kubernetes. It also introduces container object storage interface, COSI, as a set of gRPC interfaces for object storage providers to write drivers to provision object stores. Kubernetes COSI is currently a sub-project in SIG storage. It has weekly meetings and it is targeting alpha in 1.23 release. Let's take a look of this diagram. Uh, so we can see that COSI is in a yellow box indicating it is a work in progress Kubernetes component. This is an object store backup repository. It can be used to export a backup and store the data. And at the restore time, COSI is used to import the backup data. So the next missing building block is a volume populator. Without a volume populator, we can only create a PVC from another PVC or from a volume snapshot. But what if backed up data is stored in a backup repository such as object store? The volume populator feature allows us to provision a PVC from an external data source such as backup repository. In addition, it allows us to dynamically provision a PVC, having data populated from that backup re repository and honor the wait for first consumer volume binding mode during restore to ensure volume is placed at the right node, the pod is scheduled. There is an any volume data source alpha feature gate, which was introduced in 1.18 and had a redesign in 1.22 release uh, there are repos for shared library for volume populators and a controller responsible for validating PVC data source. Um, and we have already got our first release from this repos. And this feature is targeting beta in 1.23 release. Let's take a look at this diagram. We can see that volume populator um, it's needed at uh, restore time. Uh, it's in a yellow box indicating that it's a work in progress Kubernetes component. It's used to uh, rehydrate the PVC from a backup repository during restore. The next one is quiet and unquiet hooks. We needed these hooks to quiet application before taking a snapshot and unquiet afterwards to ensure application consistency. We investigated how quiet unquiet works in different types of workloads. They have different semantics. We want to design a generic mechanism to run commands in containers, but we want to mention that application specific semantic is out of scope. We currently have a proposal called a container notifier. CAP is submitted and be reviewed. Uh, we are targeting uh, 
alpha. Well, actually, we are targeting alpha in 1.24 release now because we actually did not uh, make it in 1.23. And so let's look at this uh, cap. Um, in phase one, we propose to introduce several API changes, adding an optional field notifiers, which is a list of container notifiers into container. Adding an inline type container notifier handler, which defines a command. Adding a core API type pod notification, which defines request type to trigger execution of container notifiers in a pod. Introduce a new gate container notifier to toggle this feature. A single trusted controller pod notification controller will be introduced uh, to watch pod notification resources, execute the command and update their statuses accordingly. In phase two, we propose to add a core API notification type and a controller which processes notification resources. Add an inline pod definition for signals and allows the API object to send a request to trigger delivering of those signals. Move logic in the pod notification controller into Kubelet. Kubelet watches pod notification objects, runs the command and updates statuses of pod notification objects accordingly. In phase three, a probe may be added if needed as an inline pod definition to verify the signal is delivered or whether the command is run and the results in the desired outcome. Uh, so as shown in this diagram, container notifier, this uh, is mainly used at a backup time to do quiet before taking the snapshot and unquiet afterwards. The next one is consistent group snapshot. So we talked about the content notify proposal, which tries to ensure application consistency. What if you can't quiet the application or if the application quiet is too expensive, so you want to do it less frequently, but still want to be able to take a crash consistent snapshot more frequently. Also, an application may require the snapshots from multiple volumes to be taken at the same point in time. That's when consistent group snapshot comes into the picture. And there is a cap on uh, volume group and group snapshot. It proposes to introduce a new volume group CRD that groups multiple volumes together and a new group snapshot CRD that supports taking a snapshot of all volumes in a group to ensure right order consistency. This cap is being reviewed. So let's take a look of the diagram. Um, so we don't have container notifier to do quiet here, but if we have a consistent group snapshot here that facilitates the creation of a snapshot of multiple volumes in the same group to ensure right order consistency. And we have snapshot APIs for individual volumes, but what about protecting a stateful application? There is a cap submitted that proposes a Kubernetes API that defines the notion of stateful applications and defines how to run operations on those stateful applications, such as snapshot, backup, and restore. This is still in very early design stage. As shown in this diagram, um, application backup handles the backup of a stateful application. It can leverage container notifier to do quiet and use Cozy to uh, be a backup repository. Similarly, we can uh, have an application restore that handles the restore of a, a stateful application. So these are all the missing building blocks that we have identified and are working on. Next, I will talk about how to get involved. As discussed in previous slides, this working group is working on identifying missing functionalities 
in supporting data protection in Kubernetes and trying to figure out how to fill those gaps. We are also working on a white paper on data protection workflow. Uh, we have bi-weekly meetings on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. If you are interested in joining the discussions, you are welcome to join our meeting. We also have a mailing list and a Slack channel as shown here. So this is the end of the presentation. Thank you all for attending the session. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you.